Alrighty, everybody. So uh, this is the third shot at In the Dragon's Maw, a wider uh, panel topic show trying to not become obsolete uh, as the news cycle shifts in the week. And this one, we're going to be diving into pretty much 2020. Um, the civil unrest sweeping the United States and the world, uh, all the crazy shit going on. And uh, I don't really think I can nail it down any tighter than that. Uh, so we got a pretty good panel today, I think. Uh, everybody want to take a second and introduce themselves? Uh, try and maybe go down the user list so we don't get uh, people jumping on mic at the same time. So that would be me. My name is Bitcoin Tina. Tina stands for there is no alternative as it pertains to Bitcoin. Hey, guys. All right, and anybody with a green mic thing uh, next to their name can't talk, so just uh, hop past them. That'd be you up, uh, Hotep. Uh, we're in different orders on my screen. Hotep, Jesus, uh, just fucking Google me, I guess. Like, you know, I fucking, what do we do? We do tech and shit. I write books and shit. Like, um, I'm just trying to be a fucking superhero, bro. Like... People, people live with these limits, right? They live with these mental limits on what they can and will do and all this other shit. And I'm just like, yeah, I got one fucking life to live. And I'm just a dude that just lives every day like it's his last day. And um, we think about human evolution, it, re it revolves around tech. So my life is tech. Mm -hmm. This is John Seth, uh, former host of Bitcoin Uncensored. Current host of occasional podcast John Seth's World, and uh, overall or all around nice guy, known known in the space as the nicest man in Bitcoin, kindest, uh, most handsome uh, man in Bitcoin. And I have accepted <laughs> Hotep Jesus. And I've accepted Hotep Jesus into my heart. <laughs> Don't forget to tell them about your humility. Oh, and I'm very humble, uh, but that—that's that, a—that's an old played-out joke. I know I'm an old yeah. guy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Marty Bent. I write a newsletter about Bitcoin and macroeconomics. Marty's Bent hosts the Tales from the Crypt podcast. And yeah, happy to be here tonight. It's 10 p.m. on the East Coast. Uh, a little buzzed right now. So I'm very excited for this conversation. Hey guys, I'm Stefan Levera. I'm mostly known in this space as a Bitcoin podcaster, Stefan Levera podcast. And I'm also a founder of Ministry of Nodes, where basically we teach people how to you know, learn how to use Bitcoin. Uh, and so, yeah, I'm in Sydney. So for me, it's around noon on Saturday morning. Uh, and thanks for inviting me. Uh, stop in the crypt. I'm not going to talk about myself, but uh, I'm also probably not going to talk too much. I'm just going to listen, Wayne, if I feel like I need to or want to. Alrighty, so uh, yeah, let's just try to dive into the craziness of the year. I mean, uh, first we have a massive global pandemic, um, lockdowns ensuing because of that, food shortages, uh, people being driven out of business and losing their jobs. And then um, in the last month or so, we had George Floyd um, killed by a police officer in Minneapolis and the ensuing chaos that uh, followed that. So really, um, I just kind of want to point out some highlights of things that have just slowly drifted back into the collective unconscious as we've entered this growing narrative of, you know, racial tension and race wars. Um, the fact that uh, Chauvin, the, the man who killed Floyd and Floyd actually worked together um, at a nightclub doing security, you know, and if everybody remembers the, the riots first kicking off in uh, Minneapolis, um, you know, there was what looks like um, a very high degree of identify or identification, an actual Minneapolis police officer that was smashing up businesses that eventually kicked the riots off into uh you know that versus a protest and you know i kind of just that's a throw conspiracy it isn't it i mean that's why i, I didn't say definitively i said very I likely okay but you know the, the the general gist is like 
we have this dynamic going on in this country where this constant narrative of racial tension, racial opposition, you know, race war is what's dominating the narrative as far as what's going on. But there are all these little things that just conflict with that overall narrative, you know, like piles of bricks mysteriously appear appearing where protesters are. So, I mean, you know, just kind of throw it out there. Like, you know, what do each of you actually think is going on right now? Election season. And, okay, I guess we're done. I'm going to uh, jump off here. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, I mean, everybody. My yeah. Like, I think really it's just a lot of people who are looking for whatever excuse to kind of shoehorn their chosen issue into what is going on, right? And so for some people, that's racism. Uh, for, you know, I, I think there's a lot of the real kind of problem in my mind is more like the way people get educated and the institutions are essentially uh, have been kind of taken over by progressives. So it's kind of like a progressive, like crazily run all this writing. So that's my take. Well, I, I first want to reject uh, the claim that it was a police officer breaking windows. I don't think that there's any evidence of that, Shinobi. Uh, despite the fact that it's 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 a cute claim, uh, I just don't think there's any evidence. And I, I think that I think that one of the big problems I have with like, sort of the modern era is that people like to make claims without any evidence. And I I I reject it. I don't think that it's a good idea to participate in. I mean, I like a, a conspiracy as much as the next guy, but I just don't I don't love the uh, I don't love the sort of rampant conspiracizing on both sides uh, about things that are likely untrue and and very either difficult to prove or uh or utterly false i want to agree with hotep it's an interesting point if this were uh 2017 instead of 2020 would things have played out quite this way how, how much how much is there an involvement of some direction of all of this happening uh, and how much of it is natural and simply spontaneous. I don't know the answer to that, but I think that that's actually a really great observation. And that was John said, by the way. Oh, well, I, thought, I thought Hotep said election season. Hotep, Hotep did. That's oh, what I, I said, I, Hotep. No, I well, agree there, too. It's been a... And again, like John says, said, you don't want to jump on things that you can't confirm for yourself. So just observationally, we rolled into the year, like goes under the rug a little bit with the spasms in the repo market. So like the economy alone was on a uh, very fragile, in a very fragile state. And then we rolled into COVID and then um, these riots. And it's, it's just been a very confusing year. And actually Sam Hyde came out with a video a couple of weeks ago and described or transitioning to as like a shepherd's tone of just like constant chaos and going from one uh, crazy event to the other, which 2020 definitely feels like that. Well, I also wonder how far back, I mean, like we tend to look at this as like a, a flash in the pan type moment where there's a bunch of things happening right now. But I think that a lot of this started, you know, many, many years ago, maybe, maybe as far back as, as the 70s. And uh, I think that there's been sort of a slow creep to to this current state of the world. Um, and I, you know, I, I just think it's interesting that as we like step forward and and uh, like I think that Hotep is right that this it's certainly election season that's causing this level of heat. But I think the fact that uh, this is s sort of deemed by half of America, the state of things is kind of acceptable, is largely due to the fact that we've sort of been frogs in boiling water, um, slowly boiling uh, for many, 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 many years. And I think that now, you know, the state of the world is uh, just kind of like very, uh, very tense as a result of that. But we got there slowly. I don't think that this is a sudden event. I think there have been people that have been predicting this sort of thing for the better part of 20 or 30 years. Uh, Camille Paglia, for example. Well, it's interesting you say that because the Fabian socialists changed their shield from the wolf in sheep's clothing to the turtle. Because 
That's how the Marxists make change, man. Slowly but surely, step by step. I have to agree with both uh, Jun Seth and Hotep. And as somebody who actually was of ascension age in the 70s, um, I've been concerned about the communists and the Marxists for four decades now. I mean, you know, if you can recognize patterns, you know, I think it's a lot harder for younger kids to recognize these patterns because they haven't seen them. But, you know, after you see a few elections, man, you kind of like, oh, it's what's next? I think we're up for a mass shooting any day now. And uh, what else do we need? <laughs> you know, like, you know, we already had the pandemic. And it's just like a part of the script. Every um, election is the most important election, right? Yeah. I mean, you just see it's like a rerun tv show at this point for me people are like oh my god what's going on what's up and i'm like uh i don't know i thought today was a normal day (laughs) you know now that marx kind of came into the picture you know and especially you know june south hotel tina the the way you're kind of tying this back long term into the 70s like everybody here is aware of who uh, yuri bezmanov is right the russian kgb agent Mm mm-hmm yeah, the defector, correct? Yeah. Um, so his, his pretty much um, his entire uh, thesis, as far as like demoralization uh, of a nation, uh, pretty much how you infect uh, the the educational system, the the cultural layer of a society, and just slow churn infect that from the bottom up, as in like the the younger generations, and just make that slow moving switch over those time horizons that people don't really pay attention to. They don't really see because they're, they're thinking in terms of this election cycle, this news cycle. And personally, I think what's going on right now is the fruition of that decades of efforts to perform that in America. And, you know, to kind of tie it uh, to the the civil unrest going on right now, specifically Antifa and Black Lives Matter, the organization. I mean, they are straight up just spewing hardcore Marxist rhetoric while trying to camouflage themselves as, you know, fighters of racial injustice when that's really just the way to get their foot in the door. Exactly. I'll tell you why I, I don't accept that, because the what you're saying presumes that somebody's in charge. And in my world, uh, this is a bunch of people act independently and, uh, you know, with with their various different goals in mind. But I don't think that there's any person in charge. I don't think that this is a KGB operation. Well, no, I think that's, it, that's it, kind of the dynamic of it, Jim Seth, is sure, there doesn't but, need to be anybody in charge. You just proliferate an ideology through a populace and that kind of just does its own thing yeah i I don't i don't reject that i think that like over time i mean at at best i think you're maybe seeing the uh the sort of like remnants of soviet uh propaganda for many many years ago uh the remnants of socialists taking over the universities uh this is you know this is the sort of the the the, what's come to fruition is sort of this like you know, this young generation of absolute idiots who didn't have jobs when they came out of college, have been feckless, and were raised to think that there's a razor blade in every apple they get at Halloween. Uh, The the founder uh, of Black Lives Matter claimed to be a Marxist. Yeah, well, there's there's a few things here that, like, that's both the co-founders, I can't, recall their names off the top of my head, came out as vowed Marxists, but I think Bitcoin Tina can can back me up on this, but in the 60s and 70s, there was like a hard leftist push where they were bombing cities and a lot of these people trying to push socialism on America, uh, they sort of failed in the 70s with overt uh, violence against the state and a lot of them went to jail. Uh, but then they got out of jail and entered the university system where they've sort of been uh, proliferating these ideas for decades. And yes, John says I agree, like a, a bunch of the young people pushing these ideals right now are completely idiotic. But I would push back and say there has been a little direction 
from these people who failed in the 70s and entered the university system. The battle is actually older, <clears throat> older than the 60s or 70s. My father used to when I'd have lunch with him and we'd, we'd have lunch with customers. He would talk about, <clears throat> he fought in World War II, um, how before World War II, the Nazis and the Soviets had a, a pact. I forget what the, the pact was, but they wouldn't attack one another. And the people who were then socialists and communists uh, were very pro-German. And there were many others who were not pro-German at the time because they didn't like the Nazis. And as soon as the Nazis had attacked the Soviet Union, the very next day they flipped and then they were anti-German, anti-Nazi. So these, these battles and these issues go back decades and generations. This is not something that just came about uh, yesterday. And most things generally have a history. If you look at Saul Alinsky, who wrote Rules for Radicals, many of his ideas are the very same ideas which the left has been using now for several decades. He was writing uh, sometime in the, uh, in the 60s. He was very popular. There were people like uh, many of his followers who later <coughs> took on political power and political office. I'm sure other people are familiar with that as well. Yeah, I definitely agree with that whole Saul Alinsky thing. I think a lot of the leftist movements, I think, have essentially followed that playbook. They've been not they've not been, you know, incremental in their demands. They have just constantly asked for the extreme and then taken an incremental move in that direction and slowly but surely just over time that's what we've seen and we've seen that across so many different institutions that i think what a big part of what we're seeing now is that so many young people have been primed to sort of accept or go along with this movement because they've all been you know programmed with this kind of marxist ideas at like school and university and i think the conservative and right-wing side of societies all around the world have not really done well at pushing back on this, right? I think, for example, Michael Malice, uh, he's famous for saying uh, conservatism is progressives driving the speed limit, right? It's just they, they, they haven't actually uh, ha sold a vision or perhaps some of that is just inherent in the nature of the state and how it is structured that it kind of help. It, th there's a lot more funding available for those people who are in some ways supportive of expanding the size of the state and that's why we've just seen this continual expansion and continual erosion in the role of the family and the rise in the role of the state is there anyone here who's more sympathetic to the movement or are we all just very uh, think it's very stupid well i'm sympathetic to the idea that there are racial issues in this country that are real and they need to be addressed. But as far as the well, actual organization, Black Lives Matter, um, I I have no sympathy for that organization. I what, think it's just a Marxist Shinobi, what, tool. What, 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 let's, let's like do something that we can all like maybe disagree on a little bit. What, what are those racial issues that you see? Just like subtle prejudices. I mean, like in my own life, I used to manage a business uh, for somebody else. And, you know, just an example, you know, th this is going to get a little complex, but, you know, the owner of that business specifically told me, do not hire lazy black people when I was put in charge of hiring. And now the way I acted on that was I'm just not going to hire lazy people. Um, I am in the position of running this man's business and that's a responsibility and I'm going to take it seriously. But that wasn't how he put it to me. It was don't hire lazy black people. And I have experienced or witnessed or seen many little subtle things like that in my life that are just, you know, that's there. You, you can't ignore it. Like, it's not like the entire society is racist. It sounds like you did ignore it. Well, I had uh, bills to pay. I had a job that paid them. And, uh, you know, I didn't personally refuse to hire somebody just because they were black. I judged people based on their work ethic. But this was the demand that my boss was making of me.
Uh, I believe that uh, only people that deserve sympathy are women and children. So that's the only people I have sympathy for. <laughs> I have sympathy for the women who have been duped by Marxism and socialism. Um, my heart goes out to them and my heart goes out to the children. Other than that, I don't have sympathy for this bullshit. This bullshit that was contrived by the media. Supported by the media. I don't have sympathy for, for anything of that. I have sympathy for ignorance. That's what I have sympathy for. Ignorant. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, but it's a, that's kind of the insidiousness of what's going on here. Like it, it's it's taking that that Marxist Trojan horse, that ideology, and like wrapping it in a, a problem or a divide that's existed throughout the entire history of this country, and it's trying to get you to let it in the door by pretending well, it's that thing it's wrapped in. It's not even this country, man. It's been going on for all of human history. Yeah, these protests have leaked. Like, they're not just in the U.S. They're all over. And this is the thing. Like, I, I mean, it's very funny to me to watch people in the U.K. protesting the things, like, for something that happens in the United States. It's very creepy. And, uh, like, I'm very weirded out by the fact that these these other nations are watching protests creep in theirs for something that happened here in a in an atmosphere that, 99% of the people that don't live in America don't understand. Like, I love when people in other countries tell us we shouldn't have guns. You know, that kind of thing. Yeah, and the, the, that's kind of what I mean, though, is like, the, the, like that's being, like, the, the entire, like, protest happening all over Europe, being wrapped in this cloak of, of racial issues, of, of police brutality. Like, in, in the case of the United Kingdom, they do not even have armed police. Like, what the fuck are you talking about protesting police brutality and murder? The, your, your police don't even have guns. The Marxists for decades already have actually, uh, I've encountered them for years. I've battled with Mar Marxists intellectually since I'm in high school. And what's fascinating is that they are, as a rule, more cohesive there's a there's a stronger intellectual background among Marxists than there are amongst people who are typically politically conservative. They have uh, they have a worldview. They have it's not to say that they all share exactly the same worldview. I'm not I'm not stating that. But there there's it's a deeply intellectual tradition, and there is a, a cohesiveness of thought, and so you can wind up with this decentralized point of view, there may be some groups which are split financially, there may not be, I, I don't know the answer to that, but they are actually in some senses all operating from quote unquote the same playbook. And there is a tremendous power and strength in that and that makes it very dangerous because there are many people who are supporters. The communists have always thought of sort of two types of people, the party members, as it were, and the useful idiots. And they're, most of the people who are acting out are the useful idiots. They're the people who listen to um, the, 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 they're the call to arms, as it were. And they may have very limited understanding. And then they're the people who actually have a much deeper understanding. And those are the people who are operating from, quote unquote, the playbook. I don't know if anybody has any thoughts on this. Well, the, play, the playbook is intersectionality, and the useful idiots are the people that believe themselves to be victims of some random subgroup, and all the different subgroups join together against the common enemy, which is whoever is oppressing them. I, I would put out, too, uh, and, and Tina's probably the one to answer this, I, I don't think that these are the people that you're arguing with in high school. I think the, the true Marxists are... People that live on, you know, they're kind of like a fuck the society kind of group. And they, they exited. They went and they lived on their communes and were hippies. I think that this group is distinctly different. I think that they're using the language of Marxism. I think that they're using the language of socialism. And I think they're totalitarians. I don't think that they share a cohesive intellectual tradition with what we would have referred to as Marxists. That's true. Yeah, I, that's I, 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 see, I see the Marxists as totalitarian. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, uh, Hotep. That was Marty. No, it was, uh, no, I was going to step in and say Jeff Vandrew, who's a Bitcoiner, but actually trends more left than your average Bitcoiner. He had a very good point. 
this week when we sat down and had a conversation about the concept of elite overproduction. And we, we find ourselves uh, at a particular point in time after which generations of students went through the university system being taught like, hey, if you go get this degree, you're going to enter the elite class, you're going to be able to get this uh, salary that financially separates you from the working class, and you're going to be able to to distinguish yourself from the working class because you got this degree and now you have the salary. And as time has gone on and we got to this point, it's just simply not true anymore. You can get a college degree, you're tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt, and you you have a job and you're actually making a very similar amount in terms of purchasing power to somebody who went to trade school in a rural city and you can't distinguish yourself financially. You're not a financially elite, so you have to distinguish yourself morally. So they create this like moral, this perceived moral superiority. They can then dis- distinguish themselves from the working class. And that's what I think a lot of this, this tumult that we're seeing right now comes from. I, I think Marty too, I think a, an important thing to note is I was talking to someone today about this actually. Uh, I, I, a real simple question. If you're really, really rich and you have a lot of money, what what kind of what what advantage do you have over someone who doesn't have much money nowadays? What's the difference between a really poor person and a fairly wealthy person? Because as I see it, both have iPhones, both or Android phones, uh, both have pretty large fucking TVs, um, both live in houses, uh, both can probably after some uh, you know wanting to uh, and saving afford Sonos. And uh, I, like, I can't figure out what a rich person has that makes their life significantly better than a poor person, perhaps other than like, I don't know, private flights, which are, you know, 20,000 a pop. Uh, access it's more to information. like status. It's, it's, no, it's access, access to information? Inform- really? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's beyond. You what see, access? it's like, it's, it's like uh, what's the old saying? You know, you, you don't know what you don't know, right? So you can say the information is there on Google, but it's another thing to know what to actually like type in, right? And they always say your your network is your net worth. Well, and that's very true, you know. Um, as somebody who grew up privileged, both my parents made six figures. Um, I can literally see within myself an advantage I've had over white people. <laughs> You know, like I, I'm like, I, I was a special kid, but I wasn't, I was special because I was exposed to things. I had a Commodore 64 in 84. When the latest computer came out, I had it, you know, like, and, and then there's like being connected to this intellectual network of people, right? Like I was connected to that. And, and, and that's really where it's not, it's not even like a wealth gap. It's an information gap because if the kids don't know about investing or where to start investing, you know, like that's just one advantage right there. And we all know the easiest way out the rat race is to invest. Hotep's actually right about this because there are things that, <clears throat> the things that I learned from my father, um, the way I speak, the words I use, uh, the understandings that I have, which give me certain advantages. And it, we don't, we're very much um, molded by the environments that we grow up in. But you're missing and, the question, though. Like, no, what, I understand. What, understand. what are those advantages? Well, I don't know. Um, <clears throat> to draw from my personal life, June Sith, I was extremely literate at a ridiculously early age um, because my family had the time to teach me to read very early. I have read <clears throat> through my entire school period. I was years ahead in terms of reading comprehension level. So I was absorbing more complex information uh, at a lot younger age than my peers. And like that, that just, that kept compounding and compounding uh, until the point that I am much better off than most of the people I grew up around. And it's not because, you know, I, my parents were just richer per se. It was the access to that information and the ability to digest it. Better off in better what off ways? In what, 
Well, you you, well let's just, parents, just, 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 let's just go based upon uh, geographical, right? geographical data. We know that a person who is further away from the city isn't going to be uh, as influential or make as much paper as somebody who's in the city. So, you know, going back throughout the ages, you always had the poor people lived further from the city. Some of them were farmers if they were lucky, but all the money, everybody gravitated towards the city. So there are there are advantages you have just living in a major city. It's like the difference between living in Oklahoma versus, uh, you know, San Cupertino, right? You know, proximity to where things are happening are very helpful. And that's the same thing that happens with information. You know, we, I think we take it for granted because we are the intellectual class. You know, if you're in crypto in the United States, you're a part of a, a top 1% intellectually. Just based upon being in crypto, because that's how many people are not in crypto. So we have advantages over everybody else who's not in crypto. Have you met other met, met other people in crypto? <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> no, bro. I, this is what I'm saying, though. Like, I, I, this is the thing that nobody seems to be able to answer. What are the advantages? Like, access to information, sure. But like, rich and people have all. So we, so we, so we've established second, one. You just said, you just said, you just said, Let sure. Just... So we established that one. Well, they well, don't my, have access to information. My point is I, though that like the access to information, like, in what way does that make your life material better, materially here, better? How it no, so, so here I, I don't think it does. I don't think it necessarily <laughs> does. Hold, hold, but there, hold, there's a perception. Hold on, guys. We're we're, we're getting. Chattery. Just, just let me try to kind of build off where I think Hotep is going with this. If you have better access to information and knowledge, Jude Seth, that information is is more tools in your toolkit to recognize opportunities, to judge opportunities amongst themselves, to uh, apply that toolkit to be able to better take advantage of those opportunities. Whereas, so you can make more money. Like what's What's the price? I mean, I mean, at this point, I'd have to give a dissertation on the importance of information. Uh, do we not understand the importance of information? I want to ask Hotep a question. So where you were leading with what you were saying, where does the inner city fit into that since that's very much close to the city? H how does that impact your explanation of things? It doesn't. It, it, it's just it's just more evidence of how having access to things can make you better. We're not comparing black kids in the, infra, in, in the city uh, directly. What I'm saying is for one example, geographically, we can segregate people and some people I have access to more resources, right? Okay, cool. So we know that we're worried about resources and information is a resource. So what I'm doing, I'm saying is that when you have access to the information, this is also another way that people can rise fast. For example, it is illegal to uh, for somebody who trade who has insider information, right? Because they can take advantage of having that inside information. So we know information is super important. I'm just showing you two different ways. And, and the, yeah. re the reason that that's the case is because information is valuable. I, like it has a literal commodity value. But the reason, I, I'm not asking this to so much derail it, but the, the reason it matters is because oh like the communist, yes, yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> the, the communist claim, I think, or the socialist claim generally is that th they're protesting because of this incredible, uh, this incredible, uh, what I mean, what do we call it? The, uh, the people that have them, people that don't have so much inequality. Um, this incredible inequality that exists and that there's some giant inequality gap. And essentially what I'm asking is what is what is the advantage of of flattening that? And the question that I have essentially is, aren't we flat? And I don't think information because like it sounds to me, Hotep, and you can you can tell me if I'm wrong. You're saying that the advantage of having of having information is that you can rise up and make more money. But the people without that much money already have almost everything rich people have at this point. There's not a large like th maybe bigger houses is the one thing that separates the poor from the rich at this point. That's it. It might also be more like not just having stuff, but like kind of the status games of it as well. Right. So people it's like. 
that uh, idea of sometimes if you are a rich person but you're living in a city where everyone is really even way more rich, you might not feel as good about your relative status in that rich city. Whereas if you are a rich family and you move to a poor neighborhood and you relative wise, you're actually kind of better than, you know, richer than those other people. And you'll have a nicer TV or nicer house, nicer car, whatever. So maybe there's some element there of like status, envy and jealousy playing there. And yeah. look, some of that is we're all human. It's just going to be there anyway. But I think you know, perhaps some of the advantages that might flow to a rich family, for example, they might be able to send their child to a better educational environment where they are hanging out with other kids who are also, you know, studious or encouraging the right kinds of behaviors that will then kind of put them on that pathway of becoming a more productive, you know, employee or entrepreneur, etc. So I think that's, for me, that's kind of where the advantage, if you will, might flow. I think we need to factor social media into the equation. Uh, I don't know exactly how I want to explain, like, bring that into it. But, um, for example, uh, teenage girl suicides have been going up, right? Uh, why? And I, the, the one of the one of the prominent explanations for that is because they have access to social media, so they're seeing on a day to day basis the highlights of the rich people every day. And they're comparing themselves to that instead of comparing themselves to the majority of the population. So it, the same the same would apply to everybody else with the internet in general. People are constantly seeing and observing the highlights and the positives of being extremely wealthy, and it's it's affecting their view of their own status. So so I, to how real, real quick, Jun, so I want to kind of tie back to like something Hotep just said a minute ago, like as far as like the, the analogy with the Google search engine, but not knowing what to type in there. You know, I think what, what Stop kind of just brought up with the, the social media dynamics is people are like seeing the end result of having access to information and being able to apply it. But that doesn't show you what to type into the search bar, metaphorically, to, to walk that path yourself. Your network is your net worth. Well, I would, I would add to all this, like, to what Stop was saying, like, the culture is fucked up right now. Like, the incentive swords being, quote unquote, successful in a social media world just produce terrible shit, like... So like the culture's fucked up at its core, and social media is just a tool to amplify that, right? At the end of the day, so like you can blame social media, but again, it's just a tool that anybody has access to, and they amplify their their worst characteristics. I think a lot of these issues came about well before social media. I, I think social media is a more current phenomena that might amplify what's already there, but many of these things have been around for quite a while. I'm not sure I see. A real difference. I just think you see the amplification from social media. Um, I, I have a story that always sort of touched my heart and saddened me deeply about this young woman, young girl, probably girl, she's probably in elementary school. Uh, there would be a lottery for the charter schools in New York City. And this girl and her family who just broke down in tears because they they lost the lottery and i imagine the thoughts going through their heads is that by losing the lottery of be, being able to go to a charter school in a community where the schools are fundamentally flawed and i don't know if they understood why the schools were flawed but the schools are flawed um it's almost like a condemnation you're condemning your entire future because you don't have access to the charter school and we have a system where the schools have been taken over for now decades by leftists and Marxists who have created an environment which has dumbed down the population. The schools have become indoctrination babysitting services uh, where it's, it's unclear what kids are actually learning. You know, you see these, these people go out and give people sort of pop quizzes on simple things that they ought to know. And maybe they're just picking the dumbest people in the world to ask the questions of, but 
I think this, they're fairly random, or maybe they're only showing the dumbest, the dumbest answers. And I don't really know the answer to that. But the shocking lack of knowledge of things which should be basic information that you should have an idea of. You know, when, when somebody asks, when, when was, uh, you know, what's the significance of July 4th? Uh, when was the Declaration of Independence signed? Uh, what was 1776 all about? Uh, questions people should just know from having been to 12 years of school. Right, they should have seen that school. musical. I did see the musical. <laughs> I'm old, remember? <laughs> But how much of this, I mean, how much of this is like, like, how much of this has to do with like the breakdown of, of work? Because I think that a large part of the number of people in the streets that are protesting, these, I mean, a, lo a lot of them are people that came in, out of college with no jobs. And, and that seems to me to be like, they've, they've been kind of protesting for the past 10 years as a result. I think they've been protesting longer than that. I, I actually heard a great comment from Stacy Herbert on the Max Kaiser show either today or yesterday where she was talking about something called exorbitant privilege and I find it fascinating that we've managed to miss this whole idea of exorbitant privilege when talking about this whole aspect of what people call white privilege or whatever kind of privilege they're interested in and exorbitant privilege was commented on by the French way back when in about 1971 talking about the privilege of the United States to have the dominant uh, world reserve currency. And it's fascinating how much of all of this ties back to money. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, we've kind of been mostly plumbing through the, the motives and the whys so far as to the, the hows or what's really concretely going through these people's heads. But, you know, yeah, that is an undeniable you know, aspect of it. Like the way the financial system works right now is not an open and free competitive market. It's not something that just forces competition and the natural outcomes from that. It is steered. It is distorted. It is planned in a way that skews the benefits of that system to the people running it and planning it. And that that is kind of the core emotional aspect being taken advantage of here in kind of stirring up so many of the people at the bottom to just being receptive to this Marxist ideology. And to answer You've taken John's, away a lot of the opportunity. One second, to answer Johnson's question before, see my answer that I reserved was I wanted to talk about the issue of debt slavery. And debt slavery is a very big deal and a very important factor in our society. Again, it relates back to money in our financial system. Now, something which was a very big topic of conversation for a very, very long time, you heard it a lot in the 60s, was this whole concept of redlining. Who here knows what redlining is? I've heard of it. Yeah, I know what it is. I have not. It's basically drawing lines around cities where black people got to live. And uh, well, it, the, requiring the effect, them to get loans for those properties. The effect of redlining made the ownership of property very difficult. And it was, it was a form of institutionalized racism. And it affected uh, the sale of insurance. It, effect, it affected many different things. And redlining did have a very big impact. I don't know whether or not we have uh, redlining today. It was actually literally red lines. Um, but... This, again, goes back to the whole issue of debt slavery, the impact of whether or not people are getting loans at fair rates based on um, what they're entitled to for their, their credit rating and the way they pay their bills versus other factors. And, and this is, that's real stuff. That stuff is stuff that really matters. And I'll be honest, I, I don't know how much of it is real and how much of it isn't and how much of it happens today and how much doesn't. But these are very serious concerns and these are very real issues. And these do matter. Economic issues matter an awful lot. Oh, yeah, I was just going to add as well. One thing I wanted to add as well is just that, again, the underlying aspect here, the dynamic is 
it's easier if you can be closer to the one, you know, printing the money, right? And so that's also what we've seen. A lot of tech companies become finance companies, right? It just, that's kind of the underlying way it's all pushing. And at the same time, it's difficult if you've had your job, you know, automated or you've been made redundant and it's harder for you to now retrain into some new job or to start your own new job because there's such a strang- strangling environment of regulation and licensing and all this stuff that is stopping the ability for people to readjust into something else and that's in my view a big like kind of understated influence running through much of what's going on over these last you know over this last you know decade or two hey uh, hotep you've been trying to unmute for a little bit you got something you want to toss in here no 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 i'm good all right but you know what one thing i kind of want to just drop out here and to kind of draw a historical parallel just in the more concrete sense. Um, you know, what's going on right now with like this this narrative being pushed of, of racial issues, racial conflict, with this underlying bubbling dynamic of, of Marxism in terms of organizations like Black Lives Matter, like Antifa, and really the the people trying to instigate and steer these events like this has a massive parallel to the actual civil rights movement and that time period in the 60s where there actually was a a lot of, of dominant marxist ideology in america at the time and in those movements to some degree where one of the actual fears of the government and a lot of part of why you know People like Fred Hampton, like Dr. Martin Luther King, were murdered, assassinated, was that fear of foreign instigation leading to Marxist rebellion and violent actions in America. And their fear of of that being a a motivating factor or a, a significant factor in the civil rights movements. And it's it's kind of this example of like history doesn't ever quite repeat, but it rhymes. In what way do you think it is reminiscent of the civil rights era? Well, I mean, just the the fact that such a, a large part of the, the public conversation and narrative and attitude in a lot of people's heads, that this is it all centered around racial issues, racial disparities, um, racial inequality, where there is this massive undertone of, of Marxism driving the core of it. Yeah, it's all the same shit. You're looking at the uh, modern day civil rights movement, both of them. Uh, the one uh, 1950s was a farce and so is this one. Well, I got to ask you like, what, what you mean by... Uh by that because i'm sure that's going to throw a lot of listeners for a loop who haven't uh, been following your your stuff in general yeah uh remember when uh mlk was about to get a uh, well we got arrested he was sitting in montgomery jail well that was a publicity stunt you can go look that up daddyus russell exposed that um when we look at uh the naacp naacp wasn't started by black people naacp was started by Caucasian Europeans wasn't created for black people. That was created to make uh, black people assimilate. They did a, a, a damn good job of it. You know, black folks in America weren't asking even be included in schools. That was wholly a NAACP creation and some of the other uh, foolish Marxist control integrationists. You had people like uh, Malcolm X. You had people like Marcus Garvey who don't get the same views as some of these other characters. Don't get the holidays, some of these other characters. And there's a reason why, because only establishment types get the monuments. Don't trust the white liberal. (laughs) Is that from the letter from the Montgomery jail? Just that was Malcolm X, right? Malcolm X, yeah, that's right. The, uh, the 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 Malcolm X thing is interesting too, because I I mean, like I think a lot of this is I mean, there sure are a lot of Marxists, 
But I think a lot of the BLM people are uh, very into the like the black Muslim stuff as well. Uh, which is pretty different in the modern day, I think, than it was. Like Malcolm X was kind of a pariah, even in that organization. But uh, you know, it's very different today with a number of its leaders and a lot of anti-Semitism and such. And I, I, I continually wonder how long it's going to take for this movement to like bear its anti-Semitic teeth. Which which movement? The, the, just the, a lot of the protesting, the BLM and or BL, BLM, uh, the, the BLM protesters, the BLM adherents. Um, I don't, I don't think that would happen. Um, one of the girls is Jewish. Uh, her last name is, uh, I think one of the girls name is Schwartz. She's a, her, her, I think her dad is Jewish. I don't think you'll see anything anti-Semitic coming from BLM. If it is, it'll be some propaganda of some sort. But it's like the, the kind of, yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to kind of take like a, a little bit of a, a gear shift here, just going in this direction kind of talking about the, the nature of things being steered, being manipulated, to, to kind of wind things back to when all of the, these protests and riots first kicked off, like the first few days after George Floyd uh, was killed. Like, there was an unbelievable amount of highly organized, rapid-paced manipulation of the flow of information on social media. Like, you know, Twitter um, recently booted off one of the biggest botnets it has ever identified run by a state actor, some 300,000 accounts operated by the Communist Party of China. And you had, you know, the, the night that the, the lights went out in the White House, the DC blackout the next day. That was one of the biggest hashtags with massive ties to botnets propagating it ever seen in Twitter history. Like th this goes to such a, a micro targeted degree that individual neighborhoods, like I'm, I'm from Chicago. I, I live in the, you know, white suburb down near the, the South side of the city. And I woke up, I think, the third or fourth day of the, the protests and riots to Facebook posts mentioning specific local businesses in my area um, claiming they were literally on fire right now. You go outside. There's not a puff of smoke in the, in the sky. There, there's nothing out there. And in digging through that the following few days, um, as far as I can tell, even in some other cities, but definitely Chicago, all of the suburbs, the exact same micro-targeted misinformation. And it was always set up in a way where a mile or two away, there were protesters rioting. And there were people in that protest, a small group, trying to steer them towards the suburbs where there were just these convenient posts about local businesses literally being on fire this moment. It is like some actor was attempting to, within those first few days, through massive targeted misinformation, steer protesters and rioters into suburbs that were pre-primed with just massive fear. Like literally something a block away from me is on fire right now. Yeah, that's fucked. So, I mean, like it, it is undeniable with any kind of common sense that when these protests first started, when, when those riots first kicked off, somebody was taking insane amounts of resources and trying to steer these things into violent conflict everywhere everywhere yeah i mean just from my personal observation it was just extremely weird how not protests but legitimate riots popped up everywhere around the country at the same time like uh sioux falls fucking south dakota it's like what the fuck yeah that doesn't happen organically somebody who organizes uh organically it doesn't work like that. 
the Soviets were at one time involved. I think that this has passed very much to uh, the Chinese. I have a friend who was commenting on that to me today, and he may be right. You know, the Chinese have enormous global financial influence, and it's very much in their interest to see Trump out of office because Trump is not friendly to them. He uh, does not, what has happened with the push in globalism has not been beneficial to the American worker has not been beneficial to many of these people. And the Chinese are not happy with that point of view. They'd very much like to see him out of office. How much of it also is driven by a lot of people just not having work, right? Because they were on lockdown. They didn't have uh, the, they didn't have income coming in. And so then they kind of latch on to this movement. I think a lot of core people in these movements well before this, I think uh, as far as the activities themselves, you have participants and depending on the different types of participants, I, I don't think you can label all the participants with the same label. Some of them are were clearly rioting, breaking things, stealing, tumbling statues. Some of them were actually engaged in peaceable assembly, according to the Constitution. Not all people were doing the same thing. Not all people could be labeled the same way. But to label a rioter who's breaking windows, destroying stores, stealing things, claiming that they are engaged in peaceful protest is simply a form of disinformation, trying to fool people into thinking things are something they're not. Treating a mob of people going after uh, people in their home, in their in their residence, a mob is by its very nature a weapon. It is uncontrollable, and when there is nobody there to control that mob, mobs do very dangerous, violent things. Um, so you, people who felt attacked felt the need to defend themselves. Mobs are very dangerous. They're completely uncontrollable, and 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 they take on characters of their own. That's the nature of a riot. People do things in riots they wouldn't necessarily do if just in a group of one or two people because they feel the freedom and the um, anonymity of the group to, uh, to do things that they might want to do but wouldn't do. I dropped a link in the uh, the chat. There's there's actually a release. Not that I go to Infowars a lot, but they did an investigation on this group called the Sunrise uh, Movement, and it, I, it it seems like an actual piece of journalism com coming out of Infowars. It's very worth looking at. It's basically a, a movement that seeks to escalate protest and escalate culture war. And it's very interesting because they talk about like tactics such as burning buildings and such like and, and stuff like that uh, to to escalate and confront cops. And they they try to get young people into the movement and such. It's run by a bunch of like white liberal women. It's really interesting. It's worth a watch. So I'm just going to throw that in there. Throw that in. What are their motives? Escalation. Uh, I imagine societal collapse. I, I think they're. I mean, they're 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 Marxists. I think the goal is to like remake society into their own image. Do they honestly think this is possible, though, or do they just want to see shit hit the fan? I think they truly think it's possible. I think that's the thing that nobody seems to understand. Like no, like everyone does the the equation. They're like one plus one equals two. But in America, and that works, I think, in, in other countries, like you have the Arab Spring and stuff. But like in America, there's like this other variable that no one ever considers. And it like it's one plus one plus guns equals like 15. And um, I wanted to throw something there about what you were talking about, about these about these women, because if we toss it, let idea, them finish. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I'm just I'm just saying, like, I just think it's really interesting because to, to your to your question, do they think they can do it? I think they do. I think they really do think they can do it, uh, and I think that they, I think that a large number of these people have not considered how many guns there are in this country and how many people go hunting. Something like 16 million people are proficient at shooting rifles at long ranges in America, so it's so it's a pretty it's a, a pretty bad bet. 
I think it's widely assumed that most of the people that own those guns are on the right side of the spectrum now. Yeah, and they tend to think of them as like redneck retards. So, John Seth, here, here's a question. Take those women and then throw in... I'd rather not. Throw in, no, no, throw in Jordan Peterson and the idea of simps. So how does that all mix together? So you have the, these people who Jordan Peterson you know, looks and tries to understand talking about, um, because I've just been watching some of this again recently. I know he's out of favor right now. But you have these men who are, that he describes, they are classified as losers who are, have a difficult time getting women. And and what's the relation? What's the, what's this um, milieu that's created by these organizations being run by some of these women and having men who um, are looking to do things to appeal to them to get their to get their know your meme? They simp. They're simps. Right. Ooh. So so how, how how does that all play together? Does it? Am I am I am I off base on this? Uh, I mean, I think that there is a large number of men right now who feel uh, very dissatis dissatisfied, and um, I, I think that that probably lends itself to a culture that's like highly feminized, and uh, men who are intellectually and sexually frustrated, and probably are willing to do things that they probably shouldn't. Is that a part and parcel of these movements? Yeah, I, I think I think it in part is, but I, I think it's like the, the, it's the soy boy meme. Uh, I think that there's been I, I think the feminization of men certainly is part of these movements. I, I mean, like, I think you just look at the gay culture in the 80s. Uh, the men who were gay in the 80s had like hairy chests and were like real men's men. And nowadays, that's that's really not what we look at when we think of a gay dude. Like the the, the man's man generally has kind of like disappeared. Which seems like a perfect breeding ground for a uh, feminine oracle to spread a particular ideology. And, and that's how we actually... get Oprah. <laughs> no, but I, I think we see like offshoots of men like seeking out that masculinity, like the fucking like following Joe Rogan because he elk hunts and shit like that. Like, there's definitely some. I don't know if you want to call it escapism, but uh, searching for that type of masculinity. It's, it Maybe you're like a Yeah, exactly. I think the question was, um, do they actually believe if this socialism and stuff work? I think they do. I think they do believe it. It's just that uh, they don't understand what they believe. And, you know, they see uh, butterflies and dandelions and shit. Not all lilies under uh, social. I agree. I, I, I think I, that a, a fun way to play with these people would be to create some app that actually simulates trying to um, control supply and demand of production of goods for D didn't uh, they, society. Didn't they literally try that with Chaz? <laughs> Not, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what Chaz was, but Chaz definitely wasn't socialism. <laughs> okay. So you just opened a door, June says. I've been waiting to uh, open myself in a bit. I'm gonna just walk through it. So I'm gonna just dump my interpretation of Chaz just out full. Um, that was organized and initially set up, undeniably, by a local Antifa cell there. Very quickly, very pre-planned, they even circulated massive min or misinformation. And this personally, I don't think is, is you know, th this might be something accomplishable by a grassroots organization, but it also might not be. If you remember, the reason the police abandoned that station was because of intelligence reports of a massive plan to destroy it. And that's what cleared that out. And then the Antifa cell came in and set the whole zone up. And it kind of ran for a while. And then you had that guy Raz show up. And, you know, Hotep, I know you, you did that, that show with him. And you, you really got into things from his perspective. But, like, by his account of things, he just showed up there. He had literally nothing to do with establishing that. 
-hmm. He had no ties to BLM, to Antifa, Mm -hmm. not even really a political person. And the way he told his like his perspective of things, he just kind of got nudged by people gradually into assuming that role of leadership and that kind of front face position for that whole thing. And personally, I think that whole thing was set up just to steer a black dude into the limelight like that and try to instigate and create a left wing Waco. <laughs> Well, it, it kind of did turn into that. You know, we had a couple of bodies drop. And, by uh, them? By who? No! Raz's account of the first night shooting was a car pulled up on the edge of the zone. Right. And somebody got out and started shooting into the zone and then got in and drove off. Black and SUV. the only video footage we have is of, of like a, a fist fight, nothing else involved, before the shooting and footage of everybody scattering afterwards and none of either of that footage um shows anybody in that tussle with or pulling a gun why is that middle gap that there's just no footage anywhere yeah i found that to be quite interesting and also the missing dead body you know the kid who they said they kept in a tent and then nobody knew how his body got in there. It was just, that was just like really weird to me too. We, we still don't have, yeah. Um, black kid gets shot in that same shooting. A black kid gets shot in a shooting. Uh, one guy drives himself to the hospital. The other one uh, was hidden in a tent. Apparently the next morning they found his body and they're trying to figure out how he didn't make it to the hospital and nobody knew his body was in there and nobody knew anything. So that was a whole nother thing. Mm-hmm. It was just it 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 definitely felt Waco-ish. It, it it's a weird. I mean, it's an interesting theory, and the, the reality. I mean, like the left, and and this is what's really interesting to me is Waco was completely a construction of leftism, one hundred percent. Ruby Ridge happened under Clinton, and Waco happened under Clinton, and both were terrible, incredible tragedies. And the well, left, real quick, I meant in like the the victim sense, like the well, victims. Well, I, I understand, but what I'm what I'm saying is, is that the left, the left does things like drives tanks into. Like this is what's amazing to me is everyone was waiting for Donald Trump to like send the military in and to have like the United States military versus the United States citizens, and they were saying this has never happened before. Meanwhile, we have video of tanks shooting tear gas into the Waco home. And, uh, you know, it's it's very interesting to me that the the left is obsessed with making the right do things that are very Waco-ish. And it makes no sense to me because the right doesn't have a history of that. Yeah, but it's like kind of what I'm trying to drive at here is just how micromanaged somebody planned so much of what's happened in the last right I'm, I'm saying that if that's true what's interesting to me is the fact that the that what is persisting in their plan is the is the false caricature of the political ideology they disagree with they believe that it's a bunch of rednecks who are sitting outside with their guns who want to shoot them black people oh, who and it's just they? not the case who is they it's important to distinguish the sheep from the people controlling the sheep and I, I don't. I think the sheep think that. I don't think that the people controlling the sheep necessarily know that. They're playing by different rules. That's a very important distinction to make. That, that might be true, but and and yet the apparent uh, plan, if if these are true plans that were occurring, um, is trying to is perpetuating this like image of the right as like this totalitarian, like gun slinging, gonna yeah, kill and, the... and they don't care. They don't care about being wrong factually about that image. Well, they, they care do, they about do if perpetuating they're trying... that image. They want people to believe that image. But that image, that image is only supported in this case if they're right, because they require the right to like, they require Donald Trump to send in a tank or like an MRAP or something like that. And he didn't do it. He just kind of sat back and was like, let them do their thing. Yeah, but at some point, some people might start doing stuff, and then they'll be vindicated. You know, it's so it, it it's it's a game. Like they're they're pushing and they're pushing and they're pushing and they're waiting for people to push back so they can point the finger. They're playing different. They're playing by a different set of rules, and we're over here trying to play by the same rule book we've always been playing by. Mm-hmm. 
They, 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 they actually are in control. The left is in full control. Like they are acting, and the right reacts. So when the left jumps, the you know, uh, the right jumps right along with them. It's just like monkey see, monkey do. You know, when the left says, "Hey, we're talking about gender," hey, you know, the right we're talking about gender today. If the left said we're talking about Trump, then we're talking about it's like the I haven't seen. Uh, any case where the right has dictated the conversation for the day on social media, um, period. <laughs> well, no, and I would, I would add to that. To like, I think my question earlier to John Seth, like, do you think they actually think they can do it? Sort of alludes to this overall thinking on the right that, like, ah, oh, if we just ignore it, like they're so fucking dumb. Like, there's no way anybody could like buy into this i think that might be like the dominant thought behind the right just well it, it's, it's partly true because there's a silent majority we don't hear from right and yeah. with guns <laughs> definitely with guns this is why the right doesn't act i think i don't think it has to do with the fact I'm that they're gonna, like i'm gonna jump in with a little fact correction here um all the data no, i have yeah, seen I is that it's like there are a fuck ton of armed people in this country don't get me wrong but most of the guns are owned by a relatively concentrated me. group of people I think Dude, he was just. I think he was just adding some banter to the conversation. There's also 360 million of them. I mean, come on, like, do the math. Not if if everyone owned 20 of them, that's still a fuck ton of people. And I'm telling you, 16 million hunters. The standing army in the world is four million. So, like, the the reality is the the reason the right doesn't act is because they have a they have a red button, and they don't ever want to push it. And I think this is what the left doesn't realize. There's a big red button. The right doesn't want to push it, but they have it. And that's why the right is very comfortable in kind of letting them do their thing, I think. They, they very carefully don't do it in the wrong places. And that may matter very much. So if you went and destroy neighborhoods, that uh, that's unacceptable. And I think you might see some of those buttons get pushed. Yeah, well, every time someone tries to push the button or or flashes the button, they they get they get in trouble. And uh, did, did you see did you see that those those two the the husband and wife that yes. from from the other week they they were just raided today and the, and the rifle was confiscated by the by the police. I did not see really. That. Yeah, that just happened. I, I sent is it that up, from when those uh, protesters went onto the private property? Kennedy yeah, Kennedy. so they went yeah, onto so the private property. They had their guns on private property, telling them to get off, and they got raided by the police and got their gun taken away. So when you even flirt with pushing the button, you get in trouble. So we have to we have to be considerate about the fact of what actually pushing the button means, and it means like saying no to not just the people on the property, but no to the people coming and try to take the guns after the fact. And it, it's it's a dangerous proposition, and I don't think anybody really wants that to happen. I think that Amon Bundy is going to be the next president, given like the direction we're going. Right. I mean, because again, apparently, like, the, like, I was just I was I'll just put this out there. It's like the not not the dominant thing on social media, but a lot of people in the rural areas are talking like, "What the fuck's going on?" Like gun sales are going through the roof. Like people are the silent majority's stacking fucking guns yes and asking yes. questions and and only one man in this country in recent history has ever pulled the trigger has ever hit the red button and that's Amon bundy is that the guy from out in um new mexico idaho i would i would what a, are we ta i don't think we're talking about the same guy then um the the dude who shot the, somebody after the crowd charged him in new mexico um during some of the protests no, no, no. no Amon John, Bundy. John says talking about the standoff. Oh, yeah. oh, oh okay. okay. Well, there, there have been my, two, my brain's stuck two Bundy, in, in two like Bundy the last standoffs. three months. Okay, the, the whole universe temporally in my brain is like this last six months. <laughs> there have been two Bundy standoffs, and I think that's important to realize. Bundy's the only one who's ever survived like an attempted Waco. Mm -hmm. But even then, though, that was, I think... Uh... <sighs> You know, like you said, well, like Waco happened under Clinton and that that was Bundy under the Obama happened administration. Under Obama. Yeah. So it was like a kind of hesitance with, with but, Waco. But how was Bundy successful? I think it would be important to dissect that. Like, how did he succeed and successfully defend himself against the state? You know, got from what I understand. 
that, but like then he rally like a lot of the community as well. So it was like a lot of social hundreds pressure. showed up with guns. Yeah, I think it does matter how many people are you know willing to kind of stand up for their rights and so on. And yeah, it just seems to me like less and less people are willing to actually do that. So yeah, it doesn't look good from that perspective. Well, I, I think it's well, a I think it's a, a crowd thing. You need someone to actually do it. And that's why I'm saying Amon Bundy is like an important character, I think, in America, because like these th- there are a lot of militias in America. We, we have actual militias. They're, they're registered. The left is trying to make these like a white supremacist thing. They're literally constitutionally allowed. Uh, they're registered as, you know, militias that can be called on in the case that the United States is, uh, you know, is attacked. And they're they train and they're generally fat old white men and they have fun in the woods. And uh, it is what it is. But like Amon Bundy sort of like mobilized actual militias where he was who cared a lot about ranching land. And I, I'm just I just think it's very interesting that like one guy was able to do that there. They seem to trust him. They put together like, uh, you know, what they put together. They were able to actually get some victories from it. I think they uh, he came out alive and I think he won in court. Uh, in a way that people didn't expect him to. Uh, the judge basically threw the case out from the state. So, I mean, it's it's an interesting... It's a, He's an interesting character in these times to me uh, just because of what he, what he was able to accomplish he, then and he, the fact that he was able to mobilize. You know what's funny about these stories like Waco and the Bundy guy? These people are actually practicing socialism, right? And the socialists themselves, like I say to them, I say, well... You know, what social economy have you created, right? Do you even have some sort of, in, you know, group with your friends where you do, you know, you share crops or like, like, what do you do in your own personal life? When you ask them these questions, they can't show you not one example where they practice socialism in their real life. And that's uh, one way to just like completely shatter their lives. But, uh, you know, I would tell them like, hey, you know, put together a project, you know, that can rival somebody like, you know, Waco or, or Bundy or uh, the Chaz or the Chop, right? Like, like do one that doesn't end bad and, 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 and show us your utopian society of socialism. Hotel, um, are you familiar with the concept of the Bitcoin Citadel? No. Okay. So there was a meme post years ago on Bitcoin Reddit um where somebody was just memeing about being a time traveler from the future and mm-hmm. he painted he painted like this whole narrative of like the oh, yeah, world yeah, yeah, falling yeah, yeah. apart and bitcoin creating a new elite class that walled itself off in like citadels or like little city states um and mm-hmm. the rest of the world went to shit and the meme mm-hmm. is so strong that bitcoiners now are obsessed with like where are we going to make our citadel or our citadels <laughs> Mm. Mm. yeah yeah I, I actually i do remember that i do i do remember reading that um I, I, again these these things are beautiful when people say hey you know i want my own citadel fucking show me bro like go do it so i can copy off your design and make it better right like this is this is this is how we evolve as a society that's why i said information is so important you know you see how somebody creates something like if if steve job doesn't create the iphone for example we're still not using touchscreen. Nobody liked touchscreen before the iPhone. <laughs> it, it was it was horrible, you know. So you know, until somebody does something and, and creates something, and then we can improve upon it, you really don't don't have an elevation of the species. I think it's also worth noting, Hotep, that you can build a communist commune in America. Yes. Just make sure you pay your taxes. <laughs> and, and 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 I I am the best uh, the, the best here to, to to talk about this because I was literally uh, born on one of those such communes mm. and I lived the early part of my life on one of those communes. A group of Christians got together. They had a commune, and my parents were missionaries with the commune. Mm. So like this is this is a thing that I like I, I know very well. And you can do that in America. Yeah. Just pay your taxes because that's the death of the communists. Well, well, I mean, you know, uh, taxes. You can't have communism or socialism without taxes. <laughs> <laughs> that's a whole bag of worms. But, but it's a good point, I think, that like America is a very flexible nation. 
and you can do if if you are a communist fine go live on your fucking like weird government go buy a piece of land for you know five hundred thousand dollars in the middle of kentucky uh you know to your 30 acres or whatever and, and have lots of wives and nobody will give you any fucks as long as you pay your taxes that's not what they want though they want to control you that's the difference they, they, they're not interested in living communism. they're interested in living totalitarianism where they tell Correct. you exactly what they want you to do <laughs> and see that's kind of the thing like on an abstract level um I think labels like socialism, like communism, like capitalism are not really helpful unless you dissect them. And, you know, for one instance, um, let's look at capitalism, socialism, and communism. Um, I see capitalism as free enterprise owner or, or ownership of capital and the use of that capital with property rights. Socialism is like some argument where that should be distributed amongst the people and um they try to play the distinguishing games between um possessions and properties and then communism i see as socialism except the people is abstracted to the state and just that that's totalitarianism now let's look at the example of let's say a car company that just happened to be distributed um, or distributed shares amongst all of its workers. All of the workers who come in, you know, attain shares. All Everybody working there owns a share in that company. And th that's a company. Um, is that socialist or capitalist? Because I think that's capitalist as shit. That's a corporation. It's no, just the know. ownership is distributed. No, 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 but it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a corporate entity competing in a market for profit. It's just the ownership of that company is distributed in an unconventional way from what we're used to. I mean, well, it's got to be... Yeah, I agree with that point, actually. Like, in some sense, that is kind of like a cap like it's competing with an overarching capitalist environment. The key point with capitalism versus socialism, though, is is there a market for the capital? capital goods of that society and that is the key point where if you looked at say soviet you know the soviet example and so on that, that they didn't have that and that was the key differentiator and that's what the real productivity um you know drag if you will or this the lack of productivity comes from it's from that specific point uh the i think the key point that a lot of the socialist types miss though yeah, I'm just going to make this point quickly and I've got to head off actually. Um, but I think the key point that a lot of the socialist types miss there is that the entrepreneur is taking on the risk, right? So if this whole worker end model was so good, why isn't it more popular, right? I it, think that's what Rolex the, does. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's what I was going to say. You know, it's like I, I founded this idea I should share fully with. The people who are probably going to ruin this country, this co uh, company, in some way. <laughs> well, is it the whole? Is it the whole question of how the equity in the company and the corporation was obtained? Yeah. Isn't that the difference? Yeah, not, not whether it's, it's voluntary. Distributed. Because the the entrepreneur or the individuals who started it chose to to distribute it in such a way. Yes. Correct. Correct. Right. Right. Yeah. Fine. yeah. Fine. They have a stupid idea of the they took on. Yeah, you yeah. can't. Yeah. You, you can't. You can't just distribute that initial risk from the founder. Like that doesn't make any sense. Hey, the, yeah. pro the, the, pro the problem is uh, it, when you don't have a system based upon meritocracy, you know, but based upon merits, you, you tend to have trouble because who, who uh, you got to remember every, com every company has a board, right? So you can't put the whole company on the board unless you're going to set your company in some way that I don't understand that doesn't have a board. As far as I'm, I, I'm aware, when you file to incorporate, you need to have a board. And those people on the board have more power than people, regardless of the shares or not. Yeah, but you can, in, you can include in the articles of incorporation of that company stipulations that the board acts in such a way that reflects the decisions of the workers who hold shares. I don't think you know what an Articles of Incorporation is, Shinobi. I don't like the, I don't like <laughs> Do using I? The terms. I don't like the terms capitalism, communism, and socialism because they don't really convey the real issue of the problem. I prefer the term statism because at the end of the day, statism 
is about using the power of the state, the regulatory power of the state, and the policing power of the state to enforce certain things. And, and all, all regulation, all bureaucracies are ultimately all about one thing, and that's enforcement. Government is all about enforcement. And so when the, the fundamental problem with most of these organizations is that you're we live in a world of crony capitalism where very large businesses look to maintain their position through the regulation of potential just, com sorry, competitors. Quick, yeah. I, sure, I just want to say in the recording, um, you know, thanks for stopping by, Stefan, and uh, you know, sorry you couldn't stay along for the whole thing. Uh, yeah, no worries, guys. Um, thanks for having me, and uh, chat soon. See you, guys. Mm -hmm. See you, Stefan. Love Take care, you. Stefan. All right, but sorry to interrupt, though, Tina. No, no, that's okay. So I, I, I think that what ends up happening is that it's a loss. You get into sort of an intellectual conversation, and, and, and you're not wrong, and there are many different types of capitalism and many different types of socialism and many different types of communism, I guess in theory, and, and that the real ultimately is about freedom. And I think from my perception, the ideal world is using – human competition to create the ideal world for consumers. So if you live in a world where there is perfect competition, and there is never perfect competition, but if you live in a world where there's perfect competition, you actually don't need government regulation because consumers and competitors really take care of the problems that arise where you might need regulation. But regulation at the end of the day is always enforcement by some state agency, which uses its policing power to control things. And so yeah. all of these things are along a continuum from perfect competition, and ultimately perfect competition very much benefits the consumer. So we think we live in a world of capitalism in the United States, and yet we don't really live in a world of capitalism. We live in a world of extreme regulation. So we take, yeah. for instance, health insurance. We live in a balkanized world where there is no real competition between various state entities, and this creates uh, a misery of, of health insurance where you have health insurance policies which cost way too much because there's not nearly enough competition. Competition does a lot towards dealing with all the problems that people are generally concerned with. But competition is the enemy of most businessmen because businessmen don't like competition. And so these discussions get very muddied and I think the focus is, is placed on the wrong thing. Statism is a huge concern to me and yeah. statism and the loss of freedom and the destruction of competition. These are the things which really worry me and I like yeah. to frame it differently. That's exactly true. Um, you know, and I always say that common, uh, Conservatives and liberals are all basically statists. They're just different forms comrade? of statists. <laughs> but you well, know, I just we to... saw it, we saw it with Amazon, right? When we had uh, the shortage in uh, hand sanitizer, right? So then you had a bunch of drop shippers that were jacking up the price of this stuff, and everybody said, "Hey, this is called price gouging," and they tried to control the prices. Well, the increase in prices is exactly what we need. Because that gives the time market to recover its its supplies, and then the price will come back down. It fluctuates based upon supply and demand. But when they start going in, that's when you see a shortage, period. Then you got people stealing, and then now government has an excuse to come in. By, by the way, Ali, oh, real, real quick, James, if I stop, you, you want to say something? I, well, yeah, no. I just wanted to chime in. <laughs> I just wanted to chime in and say that... Um, touching back to something that was mentioned a couple minutes ago, if you have to register your company, and if your company requires a board by government law, is, is that even capitalism? <laughs> ding, 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 no. ding, 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 it's ding, ding. It's not at all. Why not? Just that, I mean, the pure fact that you have to follow your business is just communist in nature. If I want to open my business, I'm going to open this bitch up. Who, who, why do I need your permission? Whose permission am I asking for to open up this business? Why do I need to file these articles in corporation and send them to the state of California? Which... I think that's such a misunderstanding of like this, the role of the state, though. I don't think that like that has anything to do with capitalism. The reason that you file a business is because you're under the jurisdiction of the, the, the laws of the state or the country. And they just want to know that you're doing that for tax purposes. Now, I mean, like a lot of Bitcoiners in particular reject paying taxes. Um, but I don't, I, I think that taxes are fine as long as they're generally like, you know, 
used for the common good and uh, whatever. But like, I don't, I don't think that it's necessarily communist just to have to register your business. June says, I, I feel like I am a departure from most Bitcoiners in this space in that I wouldn't call myself an AMCAP. And that's because I think that you can have a legitimate state, but to do that, read the law by Frederick Bastiat. The state's only morally legitimate argument in existing is that there is a presumption I have an innate natural right to defend myself, my property, and my livelihood, lethally if need be. So if I'm allowed to do that for myself, why isn't my neighbor? That's a simple why, answer. Why, is it, why isn't my, my family, my friends? And no, he, m- my answer is that's completely fine. And that's the abstraction that a legitimate state is built upon. But the instant that it steps outside of voluntary assent in terms of funding and the instant that it steps outside the lines of doing anything but defending individuals' negative rights, it has become illegitimate. Well, uh, not to get into that whole discussion because like, I think it does get us really far away from the topic that we are here to discuss, but... I, I have mean, a hard, I have a hard swing back for that. I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm going to so, go down the Alex Jones hole. You know? How does how does the government? Uh, I mean, how do you manage externalities in your world? Um, ultimately, uh, ultimately, that's Darwinistic. You can't. Nobody has a plan. Everybody has a plan to get punched in the face. So. But but the he state says, does manage externalities right now. I mean, you can argue as to whether they do it well. Like but they what? do do it well. Yeah, like, like for example, uh, Hotep, if you uh, if you start a company who's like, let's say that let's say that the world of Captain Planet is real, and Hotep is a businessman, and Hotep has a business uh, whose entire profit comes from dumping shit into a lake. I don't know how that works, but that's the plot of every Captain Planet episode. Uh, the <laughs> the state the state has uh, the state has the ability. To come and tell you, you know, uh, Hotep, you gotta, you gotta stop uh, with that pipe shitting into the lake, uh, and the damage you've done is this much, and the the amount of money that we will have to spend in order to restore that lake to its original pristineness is this much. All so right, so this so, is how much so, you owe. so let's say let's say Tyler Durden pops up in this scene, and and he C fours the entire building. That this exactly. company, this company is, is this state is now going to put Mr. Tyler Durden, who's done something right for the people behind bars. And these people exactly. and these people who have, have been dumping filth into the oceans and killing Earth are going to walk away with him. Well, again, exactly. That, the, oh, June said, this is what I meant when I state. said <laughs> this is ultimately Darwinistic. Remove an illegitimate state from the picture, and what's going to happen is the Vigilante hypothetical, justice. the hypothetical Hotep is going to get shot in the face by the community that lives near that lake, and they're going to take all his shit and sell it or or make money with it somehow to pay for fixing the lake. And well, you can't what, make money uh, by blowing the building up unless, uh, you know, like th- this is no, the, but this you, is here's ultimately the point. The, it's like this is Darwinistic. If it, only not two Shinobi. people in a community of a thousand want to do that and they go do that and everyone else disagrees with it, then those two are in the shit. If the you, entire community uh, like thinks that's what to do, it probably won't even lead to the hypothetical Hotep getting shot. He'll just get a bunch of We can of do this the nonviolent way. We could do this the nonviolent way and 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 if people weren't so and no and, and if people weren't so uh distracted by media, uh, the people who uh support this organization in the economy could just divest. Uh and you can put the people out of business that way. You know, uh, there's different. There, there's well, there's is, plenty of ways that, that, that people that, can can do this stuff without that ignores the, state. the externality. Because like you're look, an, an externality. I mean, they're not going to be pumping shit into the ocean unless they're doing that at profit. I don't know anybody that spends their resources to pump shit into the ocean. <laughs> uh, exactly. It's not. It's it's. This is the Captain Planet world. But like here, look, I'm I'm all it's, for this it's in a the world. world where your dollar 
or Bitcoin, uh, wherever you choose to put it, is exponentially more important than your fucking vote. Exponentially. But why would, if, if Hotep could profit by, like, his company dumping into this lake, and Hotep has, uh, does not own a property on the lake, in fact, he lives uh, 10 states away, uh, he, he's not actually feeling the effects of this. Like that's that's literally what an externality is. Is that the, you know the market can't price it in, price in the effects of what you're doing, and that that occurs occasionally. It's not super like super uh, super common, but there are companies that are basically set up in in their entirety to take advantage of like Junsa. externalities that are underpriced. We live in a brave new virtue signaling world, honey. Yeah, I think I think the 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 state great job of. Protecting corporations in a proper protecting people. Sometimes. That's the design of regulation. <laughs> exactly. But if, what if you had comp? Uh, last like 10, 15 seconds on the recording got lost. Uh, fucking shitty ass ISP. It's all good, but like, Tina, I like that, that does already exist. Like you see people flooding out of New York, California, going to ruin Denver and fucking Austin. But uh, real, quick, the, real quick, assuming I have a funny sound effect in Surrey where I disconnected and the recording cut out, sum up like the last 15 seconds uh, before I just previously interrupted you, Marty. Johnson says some really smart things. Everyone else said stupid things. Shut up, Johnson. Uh, did you get what I said about competition? I said, Marty. I said, well, yeah, well, Tina said that, uh, what, what if there were like 15 sovereign states within the United States? Or 13. Or 13. That, yeah, the original 13. I mean, <laughs> my, my point is that it already exists. Like you see this jurisdictional arbitrage already playing out. Like people are flooding out. Like people are finally sick of San Francisco. No, not, sub Austin, not, not subject not to a federal law. No, no federation between those organizations. They might have some kind of loose coordination, but there's no overriding federal control. Isn't that the world? You would need, yes. you would need a, a, a time machine to go back to 1776. Mm -hmm. I just don't see how that's different than the world. Like we have lots well, and lots of nations said, it's competing. It's the difference between the Articles of Confederation and the Constitution. And honestly, I feel very strongly because of the Bill of Rights in trying to make the the Constitution work, and I have most of my life. But honestly, in the last six months, June Seth, um, I really do wonder if um, negating the Articles of Confederation was the single greatest fuck up that the founders of this country made. Well, Bingo. Thomas Jefferson might have agreed with you. It's actually quite difficult to move from uh, country to country, but within the continental United States, it would be easier if you actually had literal countries and there was a competition to move uh, between various entities. It might be substantially easier than uh, than. I mean, Europe Europe would be very much like that today, but they they created an overriding controlling body in the form of the EU. But I'm saying without having those overriding structures. And the federal government has become almost like a supranational structure within the United States. And there's, there is um, subordination of state law to federal law. But I'm saying eliminating that and having real competition between states, and, and, and maybe it's not 50 states, maybe it's only 15 countries bounded together or 10 or whatever the number is, it doesn't really matter. But once you have real competition, that changes the entire dynamic and, and, and creates a very different dynamic when, when people are interested in competing for your business and your, and your spending. It just changes the desire when they don't have to, when they can simply rely on it. We see this with the problem with schools. Schools are set up by geography and there's no competition at all. And the schools have degenerated into something really abysmally bad. Except in New uh, Orleans. I'm not familiar with New Orleans. Explain it. After Katrina, they had to get their schools up and running, and they couldn't. 
So they uh, es essentially asked every entrepreneur in America to come into New Orleans and establish a charter program. So there's huge competition between <coughs> individual schools in New Orleans now. So you're basically conceding my point. Well, I don't disagree right. that competition is important. I, I just don't think like I think if you were to move it to the state level, then all of a sudden you have an argument about like the subordination of uh, counties to the to... state or the subordination of uh, cities to the county. Like it's it's a little bit you're like, I don't see how we are in a state of nature that's any different than what you just described. Yeah, it's a bit reductive. And I think this whole covid situation. Perfectly just perfectly describes what you're talking about i mean whether you love him or hate him trump delegated a lot of the responsibilities to the states and i think that's what's interesting about our government and political system particularly is it really depends on the president at the time and how he's willing to delegate those powers all right so i'm going to open up a hallway with two doors here we can I take door number one. We, we can continue debating. Uh, well, June says you just wrecked it because now I can arbitrarily decide your position for you. <laughs> dangerously. Um, we can either go down the Alex Jones hole of me, again, re-anchoring us to the, the civil unrest and the, the concrete of 2020, or we can flesh out the, the abstract discussion we're having a little bit now before I pull the Alex Joan hatch. I'm interested to see what this Alex Jones hatch thing is. Okay. So let's reground the, the general anchor topic of all of this as the general civil unrest um, originating in america and kind of franchising itself through the world right now um and think about the backdrop of that the pandemic of covid or the ccp virus um <laughs> this was a thing that based on all the evidence was known about in december by the ccp they hit it they locked down their military facilities, but they didn't, they didn't do anything with the public. They actually arrested doctors in Wuhan um, trying to sound the alarm about this, and they stayed quiet. They swept things under the rug. All of the interrelations with the World Health Organization. And then the curious, curious dynamic of Wuhan and Huibei Province airport traffic. Um, they let any flight that wanted to fly out internationally go through no problem, but nothing that went to other regions of China. Um, smells to me like they, they realized the shit hit the fan. Um, make it the whole world's problem so that it's not just our economy that gets fucked that we don't just take one for the team and lose our entire global power dominance play and then look at all the connections to china being dug up in our university systems um, intelligence operations ran domestically in the u.s just how riddled with ccp party members all kinds of parts of our society are and all these organized riots that kicked off and the Marxist ideology behind them. And just remember that that virus was how this year kicked off. Well, I think that we're at war with China. I think that's pretty obvious. Yeah. We're definitely in the midst of a very strong cold war at the least. Well, I think it, I think it goes hot. Do you think it it's fought via proxy wars or or head on at some point? I, I think it's a full on hot war at some point. Um, well, to just touch on the proxy war side, um, what what do you think is going on with these riots right now? 
with all the coordination, the pre-planning, the wide scope of it. I mean, right while we're trying to pick apart the, the intelligence network they have built up in our country. I mean, yeah, it's pretty fucking obvious at this time that they definitely infiltrated the university system to some extent, potentially extremely material. Uh, I mean, just personally, I don't think we should be dealing with China, the fact. It's just like if we were going to have this woke culture here in the United States, I think it's completely hypocritical to just turn a blind eye to China and the fact that they have concentration camps and uh, are extremely terrible in regards to human rights like it, it, it's like if you're trying to be like logically consistent it doesn't make any sense why we would support them at all we made a huge mistake back in the 90s when we went for this like sort of uh globalism thing where we started you know outsourcing and everything else uh i i think that like economists failed to see the forest for the trees and I think, a, I mean, a large part of the social unrest, I think, is is in part uh, easy to easy to get people who aren't working in jobs where they feel fulfilled, uh, you know, factory jobs, which for whatever reason, I can't do them, but they seem to make people feel very fulfilled, like they've accomplished something and done something for the day. And uh, I think I think apart from that, we've essentially turned our economy into a service economy and given all of our technology to a country that was our enemy in the 90s. They're not our en- they're our enemy today. They're they were our enemy then and I can't imagine why uh how how the world ended up in such a place that we thought it would be a good idea to send our tech to a place that hates us. We look forward to stealing all of your intellectual properties. But like you know, I you, wait, Shinobi. I thought you thought intellectual property should uh, oh, I do. all be open just, source. It, it, and, it, it oh. was a, it's a quote from Mr. Robot with a, a Chinese operative looking at an IBM executive and speaking in Chinese. No, no, I know, I know. But but how does that how how does that point of view that you have on intellectual property fall into this whole issue? Vis-a-vis I don't the Chinese? think that there's anything wrong with trying to keep things secret. I just don't think you have the right to show up at somebody's house with a gun because you fucked up keeping something secret. I'm going to step in here. We're going to keep this on an Alex Jones tip. Like, is there a concerted effort via China or some like huge communist entity to, to force the system on America? Like, yes. There, yes. Does, like, there does seem like there's been concerted effort in recent months. Follow the Chinese money into America. Um, and I'm not saying that this is like a, a clear black and white divide between the Democrat and Republican Party, because it's not. But it definitely slants Democrat. And Mitch McConnell. A lot of people in the Republican Party, but... But and it's, a lot, it's a lot, a lot more in the Democrat. And like the 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 point I'm trying to to kind of make here is my take on this whole year at the Alex Jones hatch here is um, China fucked up and they let some nasty ass shit out of a lab. And they spent some time trying to sweep that under the rug and keep it under wraps. And then they realized that's not going to work. So they opened the floodgates to the whole rest of the world, um, tried to contain it domestically, and they're just making power plays everywhere now. And like all, all of the, these riots and the, the instigation of things behind the scenes and that – um, my take is that the, the Soviets were clearly pulling um, Bezmenov's playbook, but they collapsed. And I think in some blurry way over the decades, China took over the reins of that. And that's just one aspect of what they're doing right now. I tend to agree with that. And, and it's in your interest to get your economic competitor to be all tied up in knots so they can't 
be effective and move forward. The United States has historically been an incredibly effective economic power, but if it spends so much time dealing with internal strife and difficulty and trouble, then it, it, it completely occupies the minds of, uh, of, of business people and, and others. And now real quick, because this, this is something I was building at and sleep. I see you in the fucking text chat. I know. Yes. For once you have said something intelligent, um, domestically inside China, they were planning on rolling out their social credit score system very slowly, gradually, and pilot programs in cities um, because even they were kind of light-footed and, and tepid about, about trying to just roll that out everywhere. Because you know the, the average riot in China um, is like hundreds of thousands of people burning square blocks of government buildings. Um. This pandemic gave them the excuse to roll out the bare bones framework of that in three months. Burning down government buildings is absolutely the way to go. Not burning down good businesses. No, but my the, the point I'm trying to, to, to kind of lay out here is if you really anchor what's going on in America right now to what was going on in China and factor in this pandemic and factor in how China is reacting to the entirety of the rest of the world. They're just trying to speed up whatever power play plan they had in the works to creep out slowly um, and just do it all now because they fucked up and let some shit out of the lab. Never let a crisis go to waste. Well, there's there's this aspect of asymmetric warfare that China has been fighting for a while. And I think I mean, I think that there is probably a, you know, a whole bunch of pages on what, you know, when, when we release the virus. And uh, my guess is like what happened here is they they were like, oh, shit, we released it. Go to page 18. And mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and that's kind of where we are right now. And part of that involves, you know shutting down air travel internally and not shutting down air travel externally. And the thing about China that really creeps me out about Corona is that they, you know, keep shutting down. They keep doing a bunch of other things. And I keep wondering to myself, what do they know about this virus that we don't? Well, then it's like, how can you even really know that they're shutting down? Like, how can you trust any information coming out of China? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, and also, like, China's got a really strange view of like what it means to reopen. Um, they reopened, but I don't. I think a lot of factory workers went back to work, but they didn't actually start making anything. We'll see. And it's like not only the strange definition side of things, but like we're at the point, Marty, where the government will call shit if it's bullshit. Like all of us have satellites everywhere. And this is a state versus state game. So, like, you know what I mean? There are things there are, that, that's a good that, point. that those privileged players know that we don't know yet. And if China fucks up in the PR game, they'll let that slip. Yeah, I mean, no, nah, I agree in that perspective as well. We're like staying with the Alex, Alex Jones hat on here. Like the theory is that China's economy is about to go tits up because it's just a complete shadow banking economy with loads of debt, go cities, and you can't produce enough production to, to keep up with the debt they accrued. They, they sort of time this up. They can blame the economic slowdown on, on COVID um, instead of just the CCP's fuck-ups. Mm-hmm. And then you really want to put your, your tinfoil hat on. This was something I was asking questions about months ago. Um, COVID is a coronavirus. So first off, what's the cross immunity effect between other coronaviruses and COVID? And two, what's the surface protein presence overlap between regular coronaviruses and COVID? Because that first one, 
affects herd immunity dynamics. And that second one affects positive cases and how accurate that is. And all of that is um, things the CDC have admitted in the last two weeks are actually the case. So just even the fact that it is a coronavirus um, introduces all of this ambiguity, all of this nobody can trust any data, any kind of model to, to plan off of based on that data, and tie back to instigating protests and riots and the potential involvement in that inflammatory or agitatory um, way that the CCP is likely involved in um, instigate the spreading of that. Don't be scared, Junie. It's okay to put the Alex Jones hat on. <laughs> Well, I I was just going to mention the fact that uh, a lot of, from what I'm hearing from doctors, uh, the early way we dealt with this disease, which was to put people on ventilators, is largely what killed people. Mm -hmm. And I think if that's true, uh, and if that's revealed to be true, there's going to be a lot of questions about like why we started doing that and how we ended up at the treatment uh the, the treatment paradigm we ended up in. And I would suspect that a lot of that came out of the way China treated it, which is a big problem considering they don't give two shits about people. Or spreading misinformation. I mean, it's, it's something as simple as turning somebody on their side or their stomach. Um, and most people don't need to go on a ventilator. And I first understood, or like, realized that reading some research paper from the University of Chicago, but apparently the original source of that is just r random medical professionals in under-equipped parts of Africa just, just figuring that out. Rather than go into debt with, with groups like the, the IMF, the World Bank, to, to fund ventilators. Or, or America or China getting in a race to spit out ventilators for the third world. You know, just saying. Isn't that kind of the game that uh, those organizations play? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm also, I'm also uh, strange, strangely, I'm, I feel very odd about the way that we did the lockdowns and everything else and people's, you know, like, it's not that it's the flu, but you know, this, this notion that like when you go outside, you're endangering old people. I mean, that's the same as the flu. That's very true of the flu. People die of the flu every year. Old people in particular are very, very susceptible to the flu and developing pneumonia from it. So it's, it's a weird line of thinking that I, I can't get past the rhetoric of the coronavirus and you know there's two lines of it there's sort of the what are they call, they're calling them the anti-maskers now and these people that believe that like masks make you breathe in your own co2 and whatever um and, and are very opposed to wearing masks when they're told to etc but then there's the other side which has these sort of rhetorical snipes at every single thing that anybody could say it's I, the lie it's the lies over masks well, don't work but they do. It's just they're not perfect. Right, which I think everyone in the government that told us masks don't work should be shot. Um, but, like, it, I, I agree with you that, that that is sort of the source of a lot of the anti-masker stuff. Um, but, like, I'm, I'm, I'm more weirded out by the, the rhetorical sniping on the other side. These, like, platitudes that are very much, uh, what's, what's the wager, Pascal's wager? Well, really, really quick. Like, I, I kind of, I, I want to concentrate on the dynamic of the third world in terms of ventilators are the only solution, because I brought that up for a reason. 
And that's the context of what China has been doing for the last 10 to 20 years is trying to play our game of economic imperialism and weaponized economics better than us. And we're kind of a we're kind of in a bidding war with them um, there in in terms of places like Africa. And our versions of those things have really burned a lot of trust. Whereas you know, China hasn't so much, and, and unless you you factor in very short term, like the the reaction to African immigrants in China, and just the <laughs> the insane level of racism there, um, with what China's been trying to sling our way, propaganda wise. And that's is kind of my point of like having to speed up the playbook. Yeah, this would be my final note. I got to jump here, but no, I mean, I could totally see that. We're just trying to accelerate everything, and it feels like China has to sort of thread a needle, considering the economic situation they put themselves in and the the amount of debt that they've accrued, and they're truly going to like continue to join the global market, which I I think it's going to trend the other way. But you know, if we're playing this out. The thought experiment way, like if they're going to join it, like they have to shore up their books, and that just may not be possible. And like, it seems like a last ditch effort to sort of fuck up things that are going on here. Um, and just try to use their political influence to to brute force their way through through other countries. Mm -hmm. Well, sorry you can't fucking stick around longer, Marty, but uh, you know. Thanks for dropping by, man. And uh, I'm, I'm going to keep pestering you whenever we do these to uh, drop by for it. <laughs> nah, it's been fun. I just got to wake up in six hours, so I'm going to get to bed. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drop out, too, here. It's uh, 12 a.m. over on the East Coast, man. Y'all, uh, you know, enjoy this conversation. By all means. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have to do the same. I'm with Hotep. Thank you, Shinobi. Well, I mean, that's where it goes. That's where it goes. But... Yeah, I think it's it's been a it's been a struggle with this in terms of keeping you guys corralled to the concrete versus wanting to wander off into the most abstract domain that we can. <laughs> well, the problem right. is nobody disagrees. I think. Right. Huh? Right. Yeah, we don't disagree. I don't disagree with anything you said. <laughs> yeah, no, it, 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 it's it's really true. It's it's hard to have great discussions when everybody is pretty much on the same page. <laughs> so what you're telling me is that I did a horrible job at trying to construct a panel of diverse views. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just have a, you got to get someone in here who disagrees because uh because then or a couple of people even because uh you know the the issue is if we all agree then uh we just kind of at that point it, it, the conversation goes abstract because we we all know what we all think about sort of the base layer. Well, touche, touche. Uh -huh. Well, I don't know. I guess let's uh, everybody just toss a final thought in the ring. Then I guess, uh, yeah, I, I guess I'll go first. Um, just looking at the dynamic of a bunch of people agreeing, um, on fundamental philosophy with things, trying to discuss what the hell has been going on in 2020, um that should at least just say that there are roots going back way deeper than just the last couple political cycles. Mm. Mm -mm. I don't know. <laughs> uh you know, like I said in the beginning of the conversation, man, selection season, all this shit is according to the plan. I don't see anything that's deeper. The only thing I see is just the same plan. Uh, and uh, it's different, you know, it's different because we're just in a different age and, you know, they can't use the same exact tactics, but generally at a high level, it's the same exact shit over and over again. You know, we heard SARS, we heard AIDS, we heard about all these, you know, diseases and shit like that. And, you know, um, I'm not afraid of any of this shit. You know, I feel like all this stuff has happened before. It's just happening again. 
Um, and next year, everything will be back to normal. Uh, I, you know, I just say, uh, vote Kanye, man. Kanye 2020. <laughs> Can you drop your interview hey. with Raz into the chat, by the way, Hotep? I uh, will. I will definitely get that to you. Um, you should absolutely watch it. Is that your final thought, though, Junsu? That's it. Just give me more information. I love you. No, no. My 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 final thought is uh, this. <sighs> Buy guns. I love you even more. Uh, Tina, stop. Got anything? I I agree with buy guns. I think that I think that America stays free when politicians are able to do less. I think that gridlock is a blessing to America, and I'm very concerned that you're going to have an election that might be stolen, and you're going to have a lot of really bad things crammed through Congress and a White House. And I think this is a serious jeopardy to Americans' freedom and could very much alter the next 20 or 30 years in the United States, which is a very serious problem. I think we're dealing with a very determined group of people who are willing to do absolutely anything. They'll do whatever it takes. And I'm concerned that I, I, I do think that there are many people who are planning on doing you know, what they want to do, how they vote. But it's always it's not the voting that counts. It's the counting. And I am very concerned about how this thing plays itself out. Uh, gridlock is good. Definitely agree with most of that. Uh, stop if you're still here. Got anything you want to toss in at the end? All right. Wage cucking it. Well, yeah, I guess. Uh, 2020 is a year of uh, intense philosophical debate. So uh, I hope this one gets people asking questions. Thanks for listening. Peace out, punks.